Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this live stream. I'm Jonathan Gonzalez. My co-host is Ken Trammell. Uh, we're going to be going over yet again in our series for the top-down shooter. This time, we're taking a look at uh, creating zombie characters that can attack our player character. So if you have any questions about anything that we're going to be covering in this live stream, just uh, post them up in the chat. Ken Trammell is going to relay that information to me, and I'll do my best to answer your questions. This is going to be fairly scripting heavy. I did try to simplify the scripting as much as possible to make it fairly understandable, but we are going to be covering about three to four scripts in this live stream. Sweet. Okay, so I'm going to jump into Unity. Okay, so this is basically where we left off before we had our player character and we went over how to uh, create the minigun for this. So if I hit play, he's just going to be able to shoot it. Now we're going to be adding in a zombie character that can, or zombie characters that can uh, navigate towards our player character and start attacking him. And then we're going to have like a health script on both the zombies and the player character so that they can both die. So we're first going to start off with the zombie character. We're going to be building out the uh, animation system for him. So we're going to have different animations for him, for his idle state, his walking state, and his attack state. So I'm going to go into the models. Actually, the prefabs first. Let's see the characters, zombies. And I'm just going to pick one of these zombies in here as a starting point. Quick Nothing. question for you, Gonzo. Yes. Uh, sorry. Uh, Omar is asking, I always forget to ask, Unity is free, right? Yes. Cool. You only have to pay for Unity if uh, you get like a, a plus, pro, plus or pro license. And you only have to get that if you're making a game that, that makes over $100,000 per year. So if you just want to build your own games and you're not selling them or you don't make $100,000 or more, it's free to use. That seems crazy to me that if your game makes $999,000 a year, it's still free. No, it's 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 100,000. No, that's what I mean. If your game if you make a game that makes 99,000 a year, oh, yeah. you don't cross that threshold and you're still paying you're not paying for it. Yeah. I mean, that's why I like Unity, it's very um I guess not forgiving. Forgiving is probably not the best word, but it's it's very good for you if you, if you're focused on revenue for a game, which obviously if you are Making games to make money, that's a very good thing to have. Unlike, you know, yeah. Unreal, and I'm not trying to jab them, but they take like 5% royalties, even if you're making like, I don't know, like $5,000 or something like that. So I prefer the, the model that Unity uses. Okay, so we have our zombie character here. He has an animator component already applied. And within this package, we already have a character controller set up. I actually did modify this character controller, but I'm going to recreate it from scratch to show you guys how it's done. So we're going to go into the TDS folder. I'm going to create a new animator controller specifically for the zombie. So right click, create, and then animator controller. There it is. I'll just call it zombie. Okay. So the zombie animations, there's not really a whole lot of zombie animations. We have like a couple for him walking and uh, I think it's like eating on the ground, but we're not going to be using that one. Let's take a look at the animations we have available. So we have a zombies animation section. So we have the zombie idol. We'll be using that as his idle state. Then we have the zombie walk. So this is going to be used in conjunction with the animation of uh, you know him moving towards the player. And then we have zombie eating, which is really not going to be useful for us. This could be useful if you want this like kind of in the background, but this is not really going to do a whole lot for us in this case. So we're going to be using the walk and idle, and then we're also going to have an attack animation. Now, the animations in this pack don't include a specific zombie attack, so we're going to be using a melee attack for that. So there's actually two of them in here that we could actually use. We have the melee one-handed, which, which is just like the character swiping. And then we have a two-handed one, which is kind of like a push. 
And to make things a bit more unique, we're going to use both of these, but we're going to randomize which character uses uh, which animation. So we're going to do that through script. So let's just start building out our animation state system. We'll start off with the zombie animations first. And these are all part of the same pack that right. you're going to be giving away, right? Yes. So once again, we're going to be giving this away on Tuesday, which is Halloween. This is going to be one of the packs we're giving away. We're also giving away a second package, which works in conjunction with this one. So this one has like exterior buildings. The other package includes interior buildings. So if you want to walk into a building, you can then use that second pack as um, the interiors of, of the building. Brilliant. Okay, so we have the idle, and then we need a walk. And then I need to include the melee animations. So we have the one-handed and the two-handed. Okay, so we have all the animations. Oh, and we also need a death animation as well. So when the zombie dies, we need an animation to be played after that. And I believe that's still underneath the animations we have. So there are like a few different animations that we can use for death. We have death zero two. So he just falls over. And then we also have dead zero two, which is just like a loop of that one frame of him on the ground. So we can use this one here. I'm gonna drag these two in there. So death zero two and dead zero two. Okay, so we have all the, all the animations that we need for this. Now let's go ahead and start building out our transitions. So the default is going to be our idle, so it's going to be orange. Let's see, we need uh, the death states are going to be part of an any state. I'll put these over here. The zombie walk is going to come off of the idle, so we'll recreate, we'll, we'll create the transition going from zombie idle to zombie walk and back to idle. I don't suspect we're going to be using idle a whole lot because these characters are going to be navigating around quite a bit. They're either going to be playing a walking animation or a attack animation, but I'm going to include that anyways. Uh, for the attacking, we can either go with the one-handed or the two-handed. I'm going to create a transition to either. Okay, and then like I mentioned before, for the death states, we're going to go from an any state. And the reason why we're going from any state is because regardless of which animation he's in, if we kill the zombie character, we want him to go automatically into a death state regardless. So we'll right click from any state, make it transition to death. And this animation will play, which is him falling over. And then we want to loop the second animation, which is going to be him on the ground. So we need to create a couple of parameters to determine when we can transition into these different states. So I'm going to go into my parameters. For our zombie walk, this is going to be based off a boolean. So we'll click on bool. And this will be called walk or walking underscore b. Let's add that in now. So going from idle to zombie walk, we're going to have a condition set up to walking true. And I want to make sure that I turn off the has exit time. So it's going to instantly go into the zombie walk whenever walking is set to true. Now going back to the idle state, we'll set the opposite. So this is going to be false. And once again, let's make sure that this is unchecked. And I'll just move this in a little bit closer. Okay, and just to kind of give you a preview, he's going to be walking and then back into idle. Okay, so for the animations for the one-handed and two-handed, we're going to have a bull which is going to be attacking. And I also want to have an integer parameter. So the bull right here is going to determine when we can actually start attacking, but then we want to have a integer parameter to determine which animation we want to go into. So either the one handed or the two handed. And this will make a bit more sense when we take a look at these scripting. So I'm just going to go with attack type int and I may need to change that later on. I'm not sure if I had that exactly the same way in the script. So going from the idle to either one of these, we'll select the first one here. Make sure that it has exit time is unchecked. 
And this is going to have two conditions. First off, it's going to be the attacking B, which will be true. And then we're also going to have the attack type. And this is going to be equal to, and we can leave it at zero. So we're only going to have two animations. So we're going to go between zero and one. Now on the way back, when we're done with this animation, we're going to be playing this animation and we're going to be looping it uh, whenever we're in range of our character. So we need to make sure that these are set to looping. And before I forget, let's go and do that now. Those are melee animations. Okay, so I did have those set up already. So one-handed and two-handed are both set to looping. That way when those animation states are, that way when we're in these animation states, it's gonna continue looping over and over again until that specific Boolean attacking right here is set to false. So on the way back, going back to idle, we're just gonna have one condition that's gonna be attacking is false. And we don't want this to be set off exit time. We're gonna do the exact same thing for the other one, except we're gonna pick a different integer value. And we'll just set this one to one. Okay, so for the death, I'm gonna be using a trigger. A trigger is kind of similar to a bool, except it automatically resets itself. So we're going from any state to death. First off, we want to make sure that we uncheck can transition to self. Otherwise, when we trigger this animation, it's going to continue looping over and over again because it's transitioning back to itself. So I'm going to be using a trigger. So let's add that in. That's going to be a parameter as well. And I'll just call this death underscore T. And that's going to be our condition. Okay, so he's going from idle to death. There we go. And then once this animation has finished playing, then we want to automatically transition into our dead at zero two. So for this one, we do want to have exit time. We want this animation to finish playing before it goes into this looping animation over here. And we're not going to have any type of condition because we're just going to automatically go into dead zero two once this animation has finished playing. Okay, so that should be it for the animations. We may need to take a look at the parameters again later on if we need to change names. Okay, so once again, we have our idle. We have our navigation, which is going to be the walking state. We have our attacking right here. Then we have our death states as well. So I need to make sure that I add that controller. I'm going to uncheck apply root motion because we're going to we're going to take our motion for this character based off a nav mesh agent which we'll be using next. I rename this guy to zombie for now. Hey Gonzo, a bit of a rabbit trail, yes. um, but I've been talking with a chat about people who actually believe in zombies <laughs> and the apocalypse. Are you one of those people? If not, do you know people who are like that? No, Since we're talking about that. zombies. I don't, I don't know anyone like that. I mean, I think it's kind of, I don't know. I, I don't foresee anything like that happening. Okay. You're probably right. But what if we're wrong? That would suck. That would suck to you. <laughs> by zombies. Uh, Phil said um, he knew a guy who he used to work for who pr like printed out a map of the route from his work to his house and where he had hid ammo and food supplies along the way. That's pretty I, hardcore. I know there are plenty of people who are like little survivalists and have all that kind of stuff, but I don't know. <laughs> not, yeah, maybe not with that, the uh, zombie element. Anyway, <laughs> continue. Okay, so we created the animation states for our zombie character. Now we're going to be using a nav mesh surface and a nav mesh agent. Now I'm not going to be using the built in or most of the built in animation or not nav animation, navigation aspects. I'm going to be using some of the uh, nav mesh components that Unity is working on. So I had to import these off of GitHub and in the new or not the new pathfinding course, but in the pathfinding course, there is a new chapter that goes over how to use these. And these are a great way to kind of add 
a nav mesh to a specific component like a, uh, a game object. So I'm going to be applying that to a floor object. And this will allow me to specify a specific area here to add a nav mesh surface that our zombies can navigate around in. Uh, this is a really, really large city. So it would be kind of a waste to have an entire nav mesh over all of this right here when we have a very small play area that we're going to be looking at at any one point. So we're just going to focus on this one area right here. So I do have the nav mesh components already imported into my project. They're right here. So we have the nav mesh components. We'll start off by adding a nav mesh agent to the zombie. So the nav mesh agent here is the same one that's found built into Unity. The only difference here is that we can adjust the agent type. I'm just gonna use the default of humanoid. And we'll leave the defaults for now. We'll come back to it and tweak it later on. But we have our nav mesh agent applied to him. This will allow the zombie character to navigate on the nav mesh based off the agent. So this is going to be actually moving him around. Now the other thing that we need to add in is an actual surface for the nav mesh. So I do have a game object in here called floor. Okay, so this is the area where I want to bake my nav mesh. And I do have a number of different colliders already applied to buildings around here. Uh, so this building over here, these buildings, some of these things have like mesh colliders, some of them have regular box colliders. But we can use that with the nav mesh surface to determine an area where the, the enemy characters, the zombie characters cannot navigate to. So I'll show you how to use this. I'm going to select the floor. Oh, and I forgot I have the default layer locked. I'm going to unlock that for now. And I'm going to add a nav mesh surface. So this is once again coming from that package that I imported. This is not part of Unity. And right now I can select collect objects all. If I click on bake, give this a few seconds. Okay, you can see it didn't detect the colliders. So I can select use geometry or I can select uh, physics colliders. Okay, so now it detects the colliders. For some reason, it, it, it applies the nav mesh on top of these objects, which seems a bit weird. Like, the characters would not be able to actually jump all the way up there unless we have a nav mesh link. Not sure why it adds that in there, but we can also specify a smaller range for the nav mesh. So if I select collect objects here to volume, I can then adjust the volume of where I want this to be big too. So let's see, let's go with uh, 50. I'll leave this at 10 and then 50. And I'll move this in a little bit closer. Okay, so I think that should be fine for our demonstration. So everything that's showing up blue right here on the floor is where our zombie character can navigate to. So if I'm walking out here, the zombie character is going to stay at the edge. But for demonstration purposes, this will work just fine. So now we have our nav mesh surface ready to go. Oh, and I forgot to change this. Right now it's detecting the collider on our player, so it created a hole around him. I can also specify to only include specific layers, and I've already done this before. So the player is on a player layer. Everything else is on the default layer. So I can select the layer right here to just use it on the default layer. And I'll rebake it. There we go. It looks like this one right here didn't get selected. Not sure why. Probably because it has a mesh collider. Okay, that's fine. I'm going to turn off the mesh renderer. Okay, so now we have our nav mesh surface and the agent applied to the zombie character, but he's not going to be able to move around until we actually do something through script to tell it where to move to. So we're going to be covering the scripting aspects now. 
For the zombie character, we actually have a total of three different scripts. These are kind of short scripts. One of them is somewhat longer, but the other two are pretty short for the most part. So this first one right here is mostly going to be for navigation. I just called it zombie. We have zombie attack, which is going to be using a trigger, and I'll show you why in a moment. And then we have the zombie audio, which is just going to be kind of cycling through anime or cycling through audio clips of the zombie kind of groaning and making different types of sounds. This is completely optional, but I did think it, it, it made the zombie look a little bit more uh, interesting. So I'll start off with the zombie first. This will include the navigation aspects. these other ones up for now. Okay, since we are using the nav mesh agent, we need to include a namespace at the very top. So using engine.ai. Here we're setting up a attack range. So the attack range is going to determine how close we need to be to the player character before we can actually start attacking. And with this being a variable here, this allows us to use this script with different types of characters that have different range of motion or different ranges. So if you have a character that has a very small range of motion, you could also adjust the attack range smaller to you know, be able to actually hit the player. If you have one that's much, much larger, then obviously you can increase that to work with that as well. We have a player transform. This will actually let us know whether or not we're close enough to the player. We have the nav mesh agent, which we're going to be using because we want to set a destination for the nav mesh agent to travel to. We also want to determine whether or not that nav mesh agent is actually moving. And this is going to be used with our animation. So we're calling it attack type. And we're just going to randomize this number at the very beginning in the start method. And this will determine the attack type for our zombie character. We have an animator, which we need for playing our animations. All right, so we're grabbing our component just like before, and here we're randomizing that attack type number. So random dot range between zero and two. We're going with two because the second number here uh, is typically not reached within the random dot range. So if we set this between zero and one, it would never actually go all the way up to one. It would always pick zero. So between zero and two, it's going to go between zero and one, which is going to be either our first animation, which is the one-handed animation, or the second animation, which is the you know the two-handed push animation. In our update method, we're going to be updating moving and attack range, which are down below. So for moving, this is going to be mostly for our navigation. First off, we want to set the destination of our player, or the set the destination of our zombie character. So agent.setDestination, and it's looking for a vector 3. So we want to set the destination to be wherever the player is currently at. So player.position. And this is how I would check to see if the agent, the nav mesh agent, is actually moving. We're going to use this because we want to play a walking animation if that nav mesh agent is moving. So if our remaining distance, this is the distance between where the agent is currently at to where it needs to go. In this case, that's going to be our player's position. If that is greater than our stopping distance, the stopping distance is going to be set within the nav mesh agent component. It could be something like, say, three units away from the distance. If that is greater than the stopping distance, then we kind of know that he's going to be moving. The agent is moving towards that destination. So if that's true, then we know that he's probably moving. So we're going to be playing the walking animation. So walking underscore B is set to true. Now, if we're not, if this is not true, if remaining distance is not greater than stopping distance, then he's probably already stopped or he's very, very close. So we're not going to be playing the walking animation anymore. So we're going to set that back to false. Now the attack range here is going to be used to determine if we're within range of the player to actually start playing the attacking animation. So we're going to set up a local variable here. This is a float called dist, so that's short for distance. Uh, and we're using a method called vector3.distance. This is going to check between uh, two positions. So we're checking between the transform.position, which in this case is our zombie character, and the player's position. We're then going to store that within our dist variable here. And down below, we're going to check to see if that 
variable is less than or equal to our attack range. So if our distance right here is say at two and our attack range is three, that's obviously gonna be lower than that. So we know that we can actually start hitting our player. So we're gonna be calling a method called attack player, which is gonna have a bool parameter and we'll set that to true. If we're not within that range, then we're gonna set that to false and then we're going to probably continue walking towards our destination. Okay, so the attack player is really just playing animations of attacking. So if attack is true, and remember this is our bool parameter that we set up here. So if that is true, we're gonna be playing a attacking animation. So anim.setBool, attacking underscore B is true. And this is where we're selecting which type of animation we want to use. Hence why we use two different conditions for those attacking animations. So we're setting it to true, and then we're setting the attack type. And then on the way back, we just set it to false, so we return back to our idle state or we go back into walking. Okay, so that is the main zombie script. I'll apply that to our character. Okay, let's assign the hero character. We're going to move the zombie a little bit further out so we can see him moving. I'll pull down my scene view as well. Let's give this a quick test. See if this is working as intended. And it is. Now you may hear some audio in the background. I did add some like kind of spooky music to the environment. Now ah, I'm stuck. For some reason, this collider gets stuck on mesh colliders. I think it's a bug in Unity. But you can see he is moving towards our player character. And then when he gets within range, he actually starts attacking us. Okay, so right now the range is a little bit too low. We can increase this. So by default set to three, I'm not sure why he's getting that close. Oh, I know why. The stopping distance is at zero. So the stopping distance is going to determine how far he needs to be away from our player character before we actually stop the navigation aspects of the nav mesh agent. So we can set this to the same attack range. Let's go with three. Okay, three units away, there we go. And the animation is playing now for him attacking. And it's far enough away that we can play the full animation and it looks fairly realistic for the most part in terms of the range of that animation. Now the speed of the nav mesh agent needs to be uh, reduced. You can see it looks like he's kind of sliding around. So I'll set the speed of the nav mesh agent down to say, we'll start off with one, which is probably a little bit slow, but it should match up with the animation. Okay, that looks a lot better overall. Okay, so now that's working. We have our navigation for our zombie, but now we need him to actually start inflicting damage on our player. And we also need to take a look at the uh, attacking script as well. So we'll take a look at the zombie attack. This is actually a very simple script. Uh, we're just including a few things in here. We have a on trigger enter. And the reason why we're including this script here is because we need a way to determine whether or not we the, the zombie character is actually attacking the player. We could, have seen, we could have something set up where we check the distance and when we play the animation, we determine whether or not the player is within distance, but we also have to account for the player maybe moving back right away when the animation is playing. So we need to have something concrete essentially for when the zombie character actually attacks our player. So for that, we're gonna use a on trigger enter and we're gonna have a collider on the zombies hand or the arm, whatever you want, whatever you want to use. And when that trigger is detecting our player character, our player's collider, then we can call a method to apply damage to his health script. So at the very top, we have a damage amount and I'm using an integer for this. And we just have a on trigger enter. So whenever it detects a trigger or whenever it detects a collider with a tag of player, 
Then we're going to get a component on that player uh, called health. So this is going to be a health script. And there's going to be a method in there called take damage with a parameter that has an integer. So this is going to be the amount of damage we apply to our player character. And actually, I can add, I can add in the integer up here, damage amount. That way we can modify this from our script. So if we had, say, a zombie character that was much bigger or inflicts more damage, I can then adjust the damage amount up here, and that will inflict more or less damage to our player character. Now it's showing up red because we haven't covered the health script quite yet. So let's take a look at that script now. The health script is going to be applied to both the player and the zombie character. It's going to be kind of like a, a generic health script. And then we're going to use an event system to determine what happens when either of those players die. Okay, so at the very top, I have a namespace for events. Since we are going to be using a Unity event, we need to include the namespace unityengine.events. At the very top, we have a public int, an integer called health. And this is going to, we could just give this a default value of 100. So our character and our zombie character are both going to have a health of 100 to start. We're going to have a public Boolean is dead. And we're set that to false. This is pretty self-explanatory, but basically when we're dead, we're going to toggle this to true. This will also be used with um, maybe even animation. So if we want to check to see if we're dead, we can then play a specific animation. Now we have our animator. And then this unity event is going to allow us to uh, basically call other methods or do something specific when we call a specific event. We're going to be calling this event whenever we die. We're going to grab our animator component, and I'm using anim.getComponent because this script is going to be applied to the main parent game object of our zombie character or our character itself. And that main parent object is not going to have the animator, so we're just going to manually assign the animator, hence why it's public. Okay, so this is our take damage method. This is a public method because we do want to be able to call this from other scripts. So public void take damage, we have a parameter of integer called damage. So we can then specify how much damage we want to apply to either the zombie character or the character that has the health script. So before we go through anything else, we first want to check to see if the damage is greater than our health. Oh, sorry. If the damage is greater than our health, then we know that we're going to die. So we're going to call the event on death dot invoke. We're going to set is dead to true. Then we're going to be playing our death animation. I believe I called it death, death underscore T. And then I tested this out before where I just destroyed the game object. Um, I don't want that since I'm going to be using this with the player. I just want the player to just stay there. I don't want him to be destroyed after three seconds. But if you were using this with just the zombies themselves, you may want to remove that zombie character uh, so you don't just have a bunch of game objects littered around in your scene. Now, if we're not dying, then we know that we can continue applying damage to our character. So we say health minus equals damage. So damage is going to be specified within uh, the method up here in the parameter. So whenever we're attacking our character or attacking the zombie, we're then going to apply damage and then we're going to subtract that from our health variable. Okay, so we're going back to back on these scripts. The last script that I want to take a look at for now is the audio for the character, for the zombie character. And before I forget, let's go ahead and add those uh, scripts on here as well. So I'm going to add in the zombie attack and actually, no, not, not the zombie attack, the health. The zombie attack is going to go on a collider on the zombie character, so I'll add that in a moment. Let's go over the zombie audio real quick. Okay, for the zombie audio, I have a require component at the very top. This just allows us to add the audio source component if we don't already have one. So when I add this script to the zombie character, it's gonna add an audio source for me. I have a zombie clips array, 
and we're gonna have about maybe I think seven audio clips for the zombie. It's just a bunch of different audio clips of zombies like groaning and making different types of sounds. I didn't want to have the same looping animation or same looping audio clip uh, playing over and over again because it sounds very repetitive. And especially if we have multiple zombies all doing the same thing, it's gonna get very annoying. So I'm gonna be looping through different types of audio clips and each zombie is gonna be looping through them randomly. We're gonna have a death clip as well. And this is separate than the actual audio clip array up here. I could add this in here, but I just decided to keep this separate. So that audio clip is gonna play uh, whenever our character dies. We're gonna have a public bull can play. So this is gonna be set to true by default. This is going to allow us to use this within our while loop down below. We need an audio source to actually play the audio. And this will allow us to actually randomize which audio clip we're gonna be playing up above. In our start method, we're gonna grab our audio source. Then we're gonna be using a coroutine. So this code routine is basically just gonna continue playing over and over again. It's gonna wait for one audio clip to finish playing. Then it's gonna play the next audio clip randomly. So let's take a look at how that's done. So while can play, while can play is true, we're gonna be looping through this over and over again. So here we're randomly selecting a number and we're assigning it to index. So random that range between zero and the length of the array. So if we have a total of seven clips in here, that's gonna be between zero and seven. Then we're going to assign odd.clip. We're gonna assign the audio clip that we're gonna be using with our audio source based on what we set up above. So zombie clips index. So this could be say, I don't know, five. So zombie clips five, that's gonna be the fifth clip within our array. We're then going to assign that to our audio source and then we're going to play that. Then we're going to wait until that audio clip has finished, uh, finished playing. So yield return new, wait for seconds, odd.clip.length. So we're checking for the length of that audio clip to finish playing. And then while this is still true, we're gonna continue going through that process over and over again. Now finally, when we actually die, we're gonna be using this public method. So we're gonna call this from another script, hence why it's public. So public void zombie death audio. We're gonna stop our current code routine, which up above up here. So we don't play those same audio clips over and over again, even if the zombie is dying. And then we're just gonna play that one death clip. So odd that play one shot death clip. Now I had this in here before, but it did cause issues. So I just had it play the death clip. So odd that play one shot basically means that we're gonna be playing this one audio clip just once. Okay, and that's all we need for the audio. I could include this within some of the other scripts, but it is somewhat longer. So I just want to keep this as a separate component. Okay, so let's add that zombie audio to him. And when I add this in, you can see it adds the audio source. Okay, so I'm gonna be including a few different audio clips in here. I already, I've already imported these already. So I have one for the background audio for our scene. And then I also have the universal sound effects, which includes a couple of audio clips for our zombie. Then I also included some that we may use later on for the player character whenever he gets hit. So let's see, we have nine total for the moaning and groaning, and then we have one for the hurt. So to assign these, I'm gonna lock this panel by clicking the lock icon at the very top. And for the audio source, let's make sure that we uncheck play on awake. It doesn't really matter in this case because we don't have an audio clip assigned, but I just wanna make sure that that is unchecked anyways. Okay, for the zombie clips, this is gonna be the moan sounds right here. So I can select all of these right here. And since we have this locked, I can just drag it over. There we go, we assigned them. Also add in the hurt right here, which is the death clip. And can play is gonna be checked on by default, so I'll check that on. Okay. And for these, I'm gonna make these 3D audio clips. And right by default, it's set to 2D. If we make them 2D, we're gonna be able to hear them at the same volume, no matter where we're at within a game. I only wanna be able to hear those audio clips when I'm closer to the zombie character. So I'll set this to 3D. And for the volume, I'll leave it one for now, but I do want to adjust the volume roll off. So I'm gonna set this to linear roll off. And I'll, I'll keep this open as we play, but if I zoom in or zoom out rather on this character, 
you can see this little globe right here. This is basically the fall off of our audio, which is way, way larger than we need it to be. So I'm gonna adjust the min and max distance. I believe at 20 is what I tested this out to be. Okay, so there's like a little smaller globe next to his feet. That's the minimum distance. And then we have the max distance, which is this guy right here, the bigger globe. So I believe that one in 20 was perfectly fine. And let's just go ahead and give us a quick test. And if it's a little bit too loud, just let me know. It shouldn't be too loud. Okay, so we can hear the audio right there. And if you take a look at the component over here, we have the listener. It's that uh, red line there. So this is where the audio is most, uh, I guess, most loud. The further away we get from the zombie character, the less we hear him. So when we're not within this range right here, we no longer hear the audio. But you can see he's getting closer to me, so the listener is getting closer, and then we can finally hear the audio. Okay, so there we go. That's the audio. And now we need to take a look at the health event for this zombie character. Okay, so for the zombie character, when this character dies, I want to do a few things. So I think we need to actually take a look at the minigun uh, script as well, which is actually going to apply damage to him. And we're going to use this, uh, we're going to be doing this by uh, using a ray cast, which is going to impact the collider of this character. So before we take a look at the health events, let's take a look at that first. Okay, so at the top of this script, right below the uh, barrels, I included a shootable mask. We're going to be using this with our ray cast to determine which objects are going to be on a specific layer that we can then affect. So I only want to be able to shoot the zombie characters, and when I shoot these zombie characters, their colliders, I want something to happen. For everything else, I'm not really interested in what happens. We could shoot other colliders, and we could have something specific happen, but in this case, we just want to focus on the zombie characters. So I want to specify that using a layer mask. We have a damage amount, which we can adjust through script. This will allow us to adjust how much damage we apply with this minigun. So I'll probably set this to probably five, we have a fire rate and next fire. I'm going to be using this because I want to adjust how many uh, impact particles appear when we're shooting. And this will make a bit more sense when we take a look at the actual methods down below. I'm going to uncomment this out for now. It's apply damage. So we're going to be applying damage. We're going to be calling this method whenever we are firing. So this is a, a pretty beefy looking method. So if you've been through the weapon mechanics course, you probably understand this already. We use this quite a bit. So first off, we're going to have a local variable called FWD, which is uh, you know for forward. We have barrels that transform that transform direction, vector three dot forward, and basically we're saying I want you to use the z axis of the barrels. We have a raycast hit, and we're calling this hit. This is going to determine whether or not our raycast actually hits a collider. And this debug.draw ray, this will only appear in our scene view. I like to use this quite a bit when I'm using raycast because it allows me to troubleshoot raycast issues. This will allow us to actually see our raycast like a, it's basically a line, and it'll show up as a green color. So we have the position of where it's going to be starting out. We have the direction, and then this is essentially the range of that, and then we give it a color. Now here we're checking to see if the end game time is greater than our next fire. So the raycast is only going to appear every now and then. It's not gonna be a constant stream. So this is kind of similar to a, almost like a machine gun. A machine gun is gonna fire slower than a minigun. So with this, we're gonna be using this to create impact particles whenever we hit a collider, in this case, our zombie characters. So this is where we're checking to see if our raycast is actually hitting anything. So if physics.raycast, we have the origin of where we want that raycast to start, the direction, whether or not we hit something, 
And then we have the range. In this case, I hard coded this to 40, which is about the same length as the, the actual uh, bullet tracer effect. And then we have a shootable mask. This is our layer mask. So we're saying, I only want you to check to see if we hit something with our raycast on objects that we specify within this layer. Now I'm using something a bit unique here. This is a uh, part of an object pooling system. So with our object pooling, I have a blood splatter impact effect. And I didn't want to create that and then destroy it multiple times every time we're firing. So we're using a pooling system. And I may go over that if we have enough time. But basically it allows me to reuse these uh, impact particles over and over again. So I create it, I enable it, then I disable it, and then reuse it over and over again. So we're going to have a, a pool of like, say, 20 impact particles that we're going to instantiate once. And then we can keep reusing those over and over again. Now this is where we're going to be using that health script. So hit .get components. We're checking to see if we hit something with a tag of health. Or not a tag of health, sorry. If we hit something, then we're going to get the component called health. And then we're going to be calling the method on that component called take damage. And here we assign the damage amount, which we set up up above. So I'm going to be setting this to about five. This should give us a, kind of a, a good amount of time to be able to actually shoot the zombies and maybe take about five to ten seconds before we actually kill him. If you set this lower, it's going to take longer to kill him. If you set it higher, it's going, to, it's going to be very, very quick to kill him. And I don't believe I need the L statement. I did have this before, so I'll just leave that as is. Okay, and that's all we need for the minigun. I'll unlock that panel for now. Okay, so for the shootable mask, we're going to set this to the layer zombie. So I want to make sure that my zombie character is on that layer as well. More specifically, the object that has the collider. So we don't have a collider on our zombie character yet. But before we add the collider, let's make sure that we add a layer of zombie. I'll change the children. I'll add a capsule collider. Okay, so this is the collider we're going to be using to detect whether or not we're actually hitting the zombie. And we have the layer of zombie. Let's give this a quick try. Now, I do have this already set up with a object pulling system. So here is the blood splatter. So once we start hitting our zombie character, we should see that appear. I believe I also have a tag of zombie. Yeah, I do. And then the hero character also has a tag of player because we're going to be using this with the attacking, which we forgot to go over, the attacking portion of the zombie character. So let's add that to our zombie as well. So I'm going to add this to his right hand. So I'm adding it to the right hand because both the attack animations have the right hand uh, used as the attacking, I guess, appendage. So the right hand is going to have the collider. I'm going to add in a box collider. I'm going to bring this down to say 0.5. It's still kind of big, but I think this will work just fine. This is a pretty large area, so he should be able to hit the player with no problem. This is going to be a trigger, so I'll check that on. And let's apply that uh, zombie attacking script. There we go. So the damage amount is going to be 20. So we can basically hit our player character about five times, and then our player character is going to die. Okay, so I think we have everything we need so far. We are going to be applying a health script to him as well. But let's just give this a quick test. Okay, so you can see the, the blood splatter 
And we could probably adjust the length of that blood splatter. Hey Gonzo, as a heads up, we have about 10 minutes left. So if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask before um, we're done for today, please do that uh, in the chat. Yes. Okay, so I set the damage amount to zero. I should have set that up. So the damage amount for the minigun should be set to five, and then we can actually see our zombie character dying off. Take a look at our zombie character. He should be dead by now. Yeah, so we forgot to add in the, uh, the death states, but we're going to do that now. So for the death states, uh, what we can do for the zombie character, I don't want to be able to continue shooting his collider. So I'm going to add in a check to see if, it, or I'm going to disable his collider. So I'll set the capsule collider dot enabled and I'll leave this unchecked to make it false. And I also want to turn off his nav mesh agent from continuing to move around. So for this, we're going to go, we're going to go down to is stopped and that's going to be set to false as well because if the animation plays of him dying and the nav mesh agent hasn't been turned off, he's basically just going to be sliding around on the ground even in his death state. Okay, and I think that should be it. I'll take a look at his animation real quick because I think for the death state, it never really actually played. Let's give this another quick test. select the zombie character so we can see his health going down. Okay, so for some reason he's not playing the death animation. Let's take a look at the animator. He's still... Oh, because I don't think we set walking to false. So we can do that in here by just setting anim dot set bool. Now this should be working with the trigger. I'm not sure why it's not working in this case, but I'll just set it to false anyways. <laughs> okay, now the animator's acting up. It won't let me click on anything in here. Well, zombies should definitely be playing the death animation. We can see that the zombie character does actually go into uh, the death state. It says, is dead. But the animations are acting up right now. Can you just quit out Unity and reopen? I, I could, but it, it would be it'd be a little bit too much trouble right now. Gotcha. Just... Gotcha. Well, I mean, I guess in a way that's decent timing. But, I mean, the game's coming along. If I'm honest, yeah. I was skeptical when you said in a handful of live streams you were going to build a top-down shooter. But, yeah. I mean, you built most of it, it seems like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've had to simplify quite a bit. And there's there's a lot of stuff I wanted to include, but I just... Game development is not, not exactly a, a neat and simple process. Right, yeah, exactly. Unlike that Udemy guy says... <laughs> Um, oh, here's the error. Completely forgot about that. I forgot to assign the animator. There we go. In general, do you find Unity to be pretty stable? Like when you're 
when you're working with it, you only get a few crashes. Um, um, yeah, typically. I mean, lately I've been getting the issue with the animator where like it won't, now it's working, where sometimes it won't allow me to uh, select something in here. It'll just like throw some random error and I can't use the animator anymore. So I have to close it out and then restart it. That's awesome. Look at him sliding. Yeah, that's the, uh, <laughs> that's the nav mesh agent. Oh, I forgot to say it's true. Man, I'm forgetting a lot of stuff right now. There's so many things to keep track of. Yeah, exactly. There we go. Man, that's pretty awesome. And so then you can like duplicate this behavior to a bunch of zombies and like yeah, what's so, left after that? So this zombie, I actually have another, I have a prefab of this, but basically I can duplicate this guy. And this prefab actually has a number of different uh, zombie characters already set up. So I can select the zombie cheerleader and I think I need to assign the material. <laughs> so let's see, zombie cheerleader. And then turn off the original airport security. Let's just place this. Oh, by the way, a question from Darren. He's asking, what was the error that you noticed? Oh, I forgot to assign the... So there's an error down here. It's actually still up here. But basically, uh, I didn't assign the animator controller to the health script. Uh, I did mention it in when, when I was going over the scripting, which was we had to manually assign the animator because on the zombie character, uh, we don't have... Where is it? Oh, I guess in this case, the, the zombie character does have the animator on here. But if we apply that to our player character, it doesn't have the animator here. So we have to manually assign the animator because if we use just get component, let me go back into the script to make a bit more sense here. So if we just use get component, if I remove this portion, it's going to be looking for the animator component on whatever we apply the script to. Uh, if you don't have that component on there, it's going to throw an error. So in this case, for if we want to apply this to our player character and we didn't have that component on the parent object, it will throw an error. Now, obviously, the zombie character and the player character uh, differ in, in what components I have applied. So when that happens, I just like to add in uh, the component manually. So I typed in anim.getComponent. Gotcha. So when you do write it out like that, you have to manually assign it. It's not, it's not going to automatically find it for you. Right. Darren seems to know what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. So we have two different characters in here. We can, you know, you can keep doing this over and over again. You could just save this as a prefab. And then the the animations and the models are going to be the same overall. You could, since all these characters share the same rig, we could just use the same animation system, the same uh, agent, the same scripts, all that kind of stuff. That's awesome. So then what do you have left? Cause you're going to do one more stream on Halloween. So what, what are you going to do to like finish off the game? So in the last one, I'll probably keep it simple. Um, I'll probably just go over pickups. So like when we kill a zombie, we could probably have them like spew out some like health or, uh, you know, ammo or something of that sort. We could probably, I want to try to keep it simple, but we could add in some UI elements where we have the actual amount of health and ammo that we have and maybe make it like a, a simple wave based game where we have zombies just coming in. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So Sounds if guys, great. If, if you guys have any ideas of, of what you would like to see in the last live stream, uh, just let me know. We're going to be ending this series on Halloween. Excellent. Um, do you think we should, uh, I mean, maybe do a, like a, a, po a polished version and like put the game, like embed the game somewhere on CG cookie, like a blog post or something. That'd be kind of fun. Yeah, we could. I mean, we could definitely and, and link up to the, the live um, event yeah. series. Yeah, that'd be great. Sweet. Oh, I don't have any more questions. Um, kind of a cool tidbit. Darren shared that uh, he has been teaching, um, I think, like f hardware, you know, like logic. And I think he said Pi, like Raspberry Pi mm -hmm. and game dev to his like 11 year old daughter, oh, nice. which is pretty sweet. Yeah, that's definitely. I've been trying to get into stuff like that too, like Arduino and Raspberry Pi. 
Yeah, and, I, and, that's and, funny. And you can use it with uh, Unity as well, so you can combine those two. Oh, I didn't know that. What's the how do you, what's the interface like to make them talk to each other? So I know there's a uh, one for Arduino. I I think there's one for Raspberry Pi. But I know with Arduino, you can also use C Sharp as well. So when I was first learning it, it was it was pretty simple for the most part. But there's a, I want to say there's like a, a plugin or an asset on the asset store that allows you to control uh, Arduino projects with Unity. So you can build like the software in Unity, and that'll like interface with with the Arduino stuff. So that, that's that's really cool. That so if you want awesome. to to build stuff like that, like if you want to build a mobile app that controls like I don't know, like a drone that you build or whatever. Right. Be, yeah. That's great. That'd be cool. Man, it sounds like a topic maybe we could <laughs> play around with in the future. Yeah, that'd for be cool. Um, cool. Uh, let's see. All right, I think that's it. Um, if you don't have anything else, we can shut down for the day. Okay. okay. I appreciate it, everyone. Awesome. Yep. Thanks for being here, and uh, we'll see you next week. Yeah, we'll see you on Tuesday. Have a good one. Bye. All right, cool. You can end the recording from your end.